In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Observe a moment of silence to reflect upon God's word and examine our hearts. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please take in hand the worship insert sheet from the bulletin. There you will find the intro for the second Sunday in Lent. Let's read it responsibly, the congregation taking the invented line. For zeal for your house has consumed me. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. O God, why have you cast us off forever? Why is your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion, where you have dwelt. Direct your steps to the perpetual ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. We say together, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For zeal for your house has consumed you. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord.
congregation may be seated. Do with me as seems good and right to you. Only know for certain 
that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and its inhabitants. For in truth, the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears. This is the word of the Lord. Please turn over to the front side of your worship insert sheet at the bottom. We will speak responsibly and gradually. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. The epistle is from Paul's letter to the Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 17. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us rise in honor of our Lord for the reading of the Holy Gospel.
6, beginning with verse 8, here we be reading these words from the new international version. Then Jeremiah said to all the officials and all the people, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and the city all the things you have heard. Now reform your ways and your actions, and obey the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and not bring the disaster he has pronounced against you. This is our text. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, although this is the second week of Lent and the festival of the Reformation isn't until the end of October, I would like to say something about the Reformation very briefly. What I want to do is clear up a common misconception about that many Christians have, and maybe even many Lutherans. Many people look back at Martin Luther's activities during the 16th century and come away with the impression that Dr. Luther did everything he did in order to form a new church that bears his name. The usual interpretation is, oh yeah, Martin Luther, he's the guy who broke away from the Catholics to form his own church. Yet Martin Luther never intended to break away from the church of his time. And at first, he was very much opposed to people who called themselves Lutherans. Luther looked at the church of his day, a church he loved very dearly, and was saddened by all the errors and false teaching he saw going on. When he turned to the scriptures, he saw the way that God intended the church to be. And so he started to preach and teach God's word of truth to try to bring people back. His intent was not to break away, but to reform <coughs> his beloved church so that it would return to what the Lord wanted. Of course, as we know from history, <coughs> Luther's teachings were branded as radical and heretical. Despite all the evidence from God's word, Luther's teachings were flatly rejected. Try as he might, Luther could not get the church of his day reform. Then and only then, when he saw that reformation within the church would not happen, did Luther see that a new church must be formed, a church that looked to God's pure word as its only source of doctrine and teaching. Now, why the short history lesson? Well, with next year being the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, Martin Luther had it on my mind. And I guess when I read our text for today, today's Old Testament lesson, I was struck by how similar Jeremiah and Luther must have felt. Both were proclaiming God's word. Both were calling on God's people to reform from error and false belief. And both were soundly rejected by the religious leaders of their day. Christ our Lord also faced the same situation. Confronted with reform or rejection, rejection always seems to win out. And things haven't changed much over the years. Throughout the centuries, God has spoken his word to mankind. He has called upon people to reform their lives to follow what he says and live in his image. And yet, his word has usually been despised and rejected by people who feel secure in their own beliefs. Scripture tells us that in these last days, God has spoken to us directly by his Son. And so it would follow that Christ, God's incarnate word, the word made flesh, was and still is rejected. Just as Isaiah wrote centuries ago, he was despised and rejected by men. Every time that we are confronted with God's word, we are faced with two choices, rejection or reform. In the message of Lent, Christ our Lord encourages us so that we will not disown his word but instead let it reform our lives. I think it is interesting, yet tragic, that God's word is so often despised and rejected by those 
who call themselves Christians. That's right. It's, it's not only those outside of the church who are turning a deaf ear on the message of the scriptures. It's also many within. Take a look, for example, at the situation in our text. Jeremiah was opposed, not by the surrounding pagans, not even by the common people, but by the priests and the prophets of the Jews. We would think that they should have known better. Why were they so blind to what was happening? It was because of a blind trust they had, or a misplaced trust. I should say. They thought that as long as the temple stood, they were safe. Sad, ignorant, and dangerous, but true. <coughs> they had traded their faith in a living, personal God for an insurance policy that stated that as long as that building over there is standing, I'm safe to believe or do anything I wish. When God's spokesman, Jeremiah, warned them what was going to happen to them in their temple because of their idolatry and their other acts of unrighteousness, when he warned them that they must reform before it's too late, they were outraged. They rejected what Jeremiah said, and they didn't want to hear anymore. They wanted God's word silenced among them. Jeremiah's situation is really quite similar to the story of our Lord's passion, the focus of our Lent and preparation. Fulfilling his role as prophet, Jesus proclaimed God's word of warning to the people. He too preached a message of reformation, of leaving behind early attempts to try and earn God's favor, and instead being saved by faith in Christ himself as God's anointed Messiah. Did the people of Jesus' day embrace his message with open arms? Did the religious leaders of his time declare, finally, here is one who speaks with the authority of God himself. Listen to him. Not a chance. Our Lord met with rejection and opposition from the priests and scribes of his day because these so-called religious men were only concerned about their own are their own political and financial security. They saw Jesus as a threat. He was stirring up the people with his radical message of faith and salvation and the kingdom of God. Jesus threatened their false man-made security. He burst their bubble by showing people their sins and their need for forgiveness, repentance, and reformation. They had to get rid of this problem. They had to silence God's word. So they turned the crowds against him. And together they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. When they had killed him, they thought they had silenced God's word once and for all. Jesus is still despised and rejected by people today. For as we read in today's epistle lesson, many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. What about us? Do we embrace God's call for reform with open arms and open hearts? Or do we, too, try to silence God's word in our lives because we've grown comfortable in our own misplaced trust, whether it is trusting in money or popularity or good health or family or whatever? How many of us are like that rich young man who once gladly heard all of Jesus' teaching and then asked Jesus, what do I have to do to be saved? Jesus said, you are seeking after the truth. And that is great. I'll tell you what, sell all of your belongings. Get rid of all of those physical things that you've been putting your trust in and following me. And Jesus was sincere in his offer. But the young man was just as sincere when he sadly turned and walked away. Scripture tells us the reason that he rejected Jesus was because he had many possessions. <coughs> In other words, he chose the security of things over following Christ. What about the things in our lives today? Most of us, I'm sure, while we may not yet be rich, 
still feel quite comfortable in terms of physical and financial matters? Do we find our security in these things rather than in Christ? Does the commitment that Jesus calls for make us uneasy? Because we may have to give up some of the things we love, like our treasures or our time. Do we then try to silence him in our lives by ignoring his word? Or we may put in our time here at church, that is if it's comfortable for us, but, but we don't want to overdo it by reading or studying his word or applying it to our lives. That would call for a change on our part. That would call for reform. The problem is that it's not a, a take it or leave it proposition. Those who despise and reject God's word will have to face the consequences. In our text, God threatened to destroy Jerusalem as he had done <coughs> once to Shiloh. He later carried out his threat when the Babylonian armies destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Christ also warned those who despised him and rejected his message that their house would be forsaken. In 70 AD, Jerusalem was once again sacked and destroyed, this time by the Romans. That brings us to our modern age. And St. Paul warns those today who despise Christ and reject God's word that their end is destruction. This destruction will not be like the tearing down of a city. It will be the destruction of souls for eternity. This too is part of God's word that people don't want to hear. Don't talk about hell, they say. It bothers me. It makes me afraid. I don't like to hear about it. But while God's word carries a threat of destruction, for all who reject it, it also carries a promise. A beautiful promise to all who hear and heed what he has to say. God's word, though often despised and rejected, remains a sinner's only real security and comfort. Physical and financial security is temporary at best. God wants us to have a security that will never end. Through Jeremiah, God offered the people forgiveness and hope, for God is always merciful. Jeremiah proclaimed to the people, Now reform your ways and your actions, and obey the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and not bring the disaster he has pronounced against you. You see, along with the warning, God provided a way out. In this, he showed his gracious love. Through his son, God pleaded for Jerusalem. Christ pleaded for his enemies from the cross. He forgave the repentant thief who earlier had taunted and cursed him. And Christ continues to extend the promise of forgiveness and salvation to any who turn from their sins and trust in him. But that will involve change and reform. Change is a word that scares many people. And the message of Lent is one of reform. Returning from the ways of the world and devoting ourselves for time and eternity to the will of God. Yet this change and reform should not be unsettling to us. For just as God's other promises the reform that God calls for is always a product of his grace. God doesn't ask something of us that is beyond our power. Instead, he provides us with the power we need. God has blessed us with faith. And that faith is a force more powerful than we can begin to imagine. Not only does faith allow us to tap into the blessings of forgiveness and salvation, Faith also allows us to tap into the power of God himself. Power God works in us, enabling us to reform our lives to his image. Of course, we can reject this power. We can continue to put our blind trust in material things for security. But why should we? God has promised to complete the good work he began in us. All we need is to rely on him and he will bring it about. Take hold of God's word. 
Allow God to strengthen your faith, and you will not only find the power to reform your life in God's image, but you will also find the desire to do so. We have God's promise of that, and it is a promise we can rely on. Rejection or reform. These are the two ways of reacting to God's word. Many have rejected it and continue to reject it each day. May we never despise or reject God's word of love for us in Christ our Savior. Instead, may we cling to him in faith until he returns for us on the last day, a day on which we will be able to sing in the words of our gospel lesson, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time we continue with the confession of our faith. Together we say the Nicene Creed.
Father, as we prepare to partake of your Holy Supper, make us obedient to your commands so that we might worthily receive Christ's body and blood. Give us humility to examine ourselves honestly. Give us certainty that Christ is truly present when we receive this treasure for the forgiveness of our sins and the strengthening of our faith. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with the gathering of our offering. service of the sacrament beginning in the middle of page 160. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat. This is my body which is given to you. This is the remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
us. And we join together in singing the new Numidus.
that will adorn the church on Easter, and then we'll be thinking home. Uh, next week is the cutoff for that, so uh, please take care of that if that's what you'd like. Otherwise, just uh, a busy week, uh, just something every day, it appears. Uh, take note of those things, and if they apply to you, be sure to draw a circle on the calendar. May the Lord watch over you and bless you. May his word work within you, comfort you, strengthen you, and allow your life to reform, to conform more and more to his blessed plan for you.